For chapter 17, we uh, remember that Judah came to an end. They were led off into captivity. Anybody remember what kingdom it was that conquered uh, Judah and took them away? Does anybody remember what that what those guys were called? Uh, they're thinking about it. It starts with a B. The Babylonians, absolutely right. The Bab Babylonians uh, took them away, and uh, there they went. And their king Nebuchadnezzar. So they're. Uh, we remember last week it captured all the emotion of what was going on. And you imagine how the hearts of the people felt like they were broken. So I think that was really something. So the first group of people that go into exile are the choicest of the people, right? The princes, um, all of the, the men that are uh, businessmen and uh, men of success and education. The best of the best that Judah had left are all taken away. And um, so we're going to go to page 249 in our story, and um, I'm going to share with you from page 249 just a brief outsert of um, who the story tells us went away. So we have to use our imagination a little bit. So these were uh, young men without any physical defect. These were men that were handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning that there was. They were well informed. These were men of quick understanding and qualified to serve in the king's palace. So these were the best of the best. Now, sometimes it's hard for us as uh, people today to imagine what these guys look like, but I thought I would help you because I happen to have a picture from that time period. Here's what we would uh, imagine these guys would look like on the next slide. Yes, there they are. It's, it is a man of well-learning, very educated, handsome in every way. And uh, probably there'll be no living with these guys after that. So, um, you know, one of them is missing, my son-in-law, Juwan. But he is not uh, without excuse because today is a super great Father's Day. What could be better than Shadrach, Meshach, and there's a Bendigo on the right-hand side there. Abednego is at, uh, right now, McLaren Hospital with his new baby. What a Father's Day gift, right? Who gets a baby on Father's Day? That's pretty unheard of. So congratulations, Juwan, right? Yeah. And Sarah, too. And uh, our new baby, grandbaby, baby, Cupcake. That's the, probably the name is not going to stick, but that's all we know at the, the moment, right? So um, we get back to these Babylonians, and the three famous names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, and I wondered uh, what of those names, if you had to have your Babylonian name, which one would be your favorite name to have, right? Which out of those three? I would probably choose, um, I like Daniel's name. It was uh, Belshazzar. Isn't that cool? I think that's a pretty neat name. Um, but so they, when they went there, they had to learn the new language, the new ways of the Babylonian people, and uh, they got new names. So you could imagine if you're speaking Hebrew and all of a sudden now you have to speak this new language it has nothing to do with the Hebrew language, right? Now, there might be some moms. Uh, Sarah might uh, think this way, right? Natasha might think this way as well. Maybe you would like this name, Into Bed You Go. Mm -hmm. So that might be a good name as well, right? So the story of chapter 18 shows us how um, God's people were called to live out God's agenda while they were waiting in kind of a time out. Remember, they were in a time of punishment and uh, for being disobedient, right? And so as parents, we know sometimes we have some punishment for our kids. And um, you know, sometimes even as adults, we have a short period of time like that. But we know that God still loves us. And we're going to see from chapter 18 that God still loved his children and the people of Judah. He still had his eye on them. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we uh, thank you today for chapter 18 of the story. Father, we thank you for your word. It's all based on scripture. So, Father, today we uh, thank you for your word. And although this story is about a people in a foreign land a long ways from home, maybe, um, Father, today your Holy Spirit will show us and quicken to our hearts how we can relate to it as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what is the power of... Of Daniel's story. So the story that's going on here is King Nebuchadnezzar is actually King Nebuchadnezzar II. The Bible tells us that um, he has basically issued a decree to every part of the kingdom that um, 
his God must be feared and reverenced, right? This is so amazing to think about. A foreign king who's conquered you, taken you to a foreign land, and look at what ends up happening down the road in Daniel chapter 6. This is King Nebuchadnezzar that says this. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His domain will never end. He rescues, he saves, he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. That's an amazing thing to think about. A foreign king would be saying that about our God. That's how impressed he was. So there's some stories that there must be in the book of Daniel that we could look at today and say, wow, our God is awesome. And one of the things that we know from the story is the things that he was at this time are the ways that he is today. So our God is still awesome and mighty in need. He's still able to rescue. He's still able to save. And we can see these things happen even today if we would have our eyes open. So how did this powerful king know that this was true? That's a great question. So he had to have his eyes open to see these miracles of how God is going to rescue Daniel and his three buddies, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So here we go. Here's our first point that we want to see today. And that is um, to stand out. Stand out. If you have your notes there, it has the word stand. Put down the word out. And this is what I mean by stand out. But Daniel resolved in chapter 1. It tells us that Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food. Not with the royal wine. And he asked the chief officials uh, for permission not to defile himself by eating the king's best. So they, what's happened here is um, Daniel and his three buddies are picked. And they're picked to be able to have uh, go to the school of the king. Where for the next three years they're going to be immersed in the Babylonian culture. Babylonian ways. Know who the Babylonian gods are. Uh, learn the Babylonian language, and then serve, that depends on what their aptitudes are, at different levels within the royal court. This is uh, when you are led into captivity, and you have to walk for hundreds of miles across the desert to Babylon, and you get there, you're not in your imagination imagining that King Nebuchadnezzar is going to favor you by letting you have it that good, right? To, handpick you to go to this school. But that's exactly what happened. So they go to this school, and they have an opportunity to uh, have the king's best. And the king wants them to be well-fed because they work in the royal court. And uh, this kingdom is very, very prosperous. It's the wealthiest kingdom on the earth at that moment in time. So uh, what Daniel says right away is, is that, you know, to the guy that's in charge of the school, and basically in charge of giving them the best, look, I don't want the king's food. I don't want the king's wine. Um, that stuff's been offered to idols. Um, pork was almost certainly part of it. You know, in Hebrews, good Jewish people are not going to eat pork. And so, um, trust me, um, we will come through this, Daniel basically says. And Daniel is, is speaking for his buddies as well. It doesn't say that his buddies were like, yeah, Daniel, we're with you. Maybe they were even surprised, like, what do you mean, Daniel? We're not going to get any uh, food and nothing to drink. But Daniel makes a stand, and he stands out right away and makes a statement that says, look, if you give us vegetables and water, you're going to see after 10 days that we're going to look healthier, we're going to be better fed, and we're going to be better off than the people that are eating the choicest of the uh, wine and eating the choicest of foods. That's an amazing uh, standard here. And just think about it. The guy might have said, okay, got something for you, Daniel. You're out of the school, right? Because the, uh, the chief official said, like if the king notices that you guys are malnourished and looking sad because you're eating just vegetables and water, guess what? He's probably going to take my head off, right? Because that's what King Nebuchadnezzar was known to do. So um, he somehow, um, it says in the Bible that uh, Daniel had favor with this official, and the official agrees. Let's test it out for 10 days. Now, you know God's word. What do you figure happened 10 days later? These guys look the best. 
They were fit and radiant and doing well. And uh, you may have even heard of these words in church. Uh, maybe Pastor John made you familiar with it in the past. I don't know. I'm certainly familiar with it in my background. It's called a Daniel fast. So sometimes people uh, fast food and, um, you know, they just have water and that's it. And sometimes people do what's called a Daniel fast to position themselves to be closer to the Lord. Not that he needs to get closer to you. He's right there. But it gets your mind off of preparing food and all that. And um, some people even today do what's called a Daniel fast, where we eat vegetables and drink water for a, a time period, a Daniel fast. Some people even do it uh, for 10 days, just like Daniel did, right? And of course, some folks, uh, that's a habit. You say, well, wait a minute, I don't eat any meat ever. I'm always eating just vegetables. And I don't drink alcohol. Well, good for you, because uh, you'd be in good company with Daniel and his buddies, because they uh, seem to have gone through it pretty well. So Daniel makes a strong statement, and there he is in the royal court, and it comes out really good. Now, the question might be asked, is God a vegetarian? I don't know, it doesn't really say that in the scriptures, and I really hope not, because I do enjoy a good steak once in a while that Miss Lisa barbecues up for us. So um, I'm not really sure, but that's where we get the Daniel fast for. But I can tell you this principle we can take away today. Here's a principle for us for today. God takes care of those who honor him. And we can see that in Daniel. Can I hear an amen for that? Yes. That God takes care of those who honor him. So um, how did Daniel now move into a position of favor? So he's made a stand right away. Um, then the story starts to unfold that later on the king has a really troubling dream. He has this dream, and what ends up happening is he has this dream, and then he comes up with this crazy idea. My um, fortune tellers, my wise men, my magi, all of those that have gone to my school of uh, wisdom and, and served me, somebody's going to come tell me how to interpret this dream. And just so I know you guys aren't making it up, you're going to also tell me what the dream is. Like his guys that work for him, his magi, the wise men and all that are like, whoa, uh, great king, you're amazing, you are you rock, you know, he's trying to butter him up a little bit, but nobody has had to do that before. Nobody has ever been asked to uh, also say what the dream is. So uh, this is a pretty tough situation, and King Nebuchadnezzar, he's the king that takes people's heads off, basically says, look, Somebody's going to come tell me what my dream is and what it means because it's troubled me so much or I'm going to have all of you executed. Now that's really something. So the day comes, none of them have been able to figure it out. They try all kinds of different ways in the scriptures to say. And uh, finally, it looks like it's the day of execution. Even Daniel and his three friends are going to uh, lose their lives. And Daniel uh, sees the chief executioner and he asks him, why is that getting ready to happen? What's going on? And he says, well, you know, the king has asked for somebody to interpret and nobody has. And Daniel says to him, look, I need to get word to the king. I didn't know about this. Give me a chance to go to God and ask. So uh, Daniel asks his friends to start fasting and praying. And he goes before the Lord and asks, Lord, can you tell us? So it's a pretty amazing thing to see here. The king said this to uh, Daniel. Um, after Daniel interprets the dream, he says, I can't tell you what it is, but God can. And here's what it is. Here's what it means. But time today does not let us uh, get to that. But it was an amazing dream. Afterwards, the king was in awe, and the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods. See, this happened several times in Daniel's life. The Lord of kings, the revealer of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him, and he made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon. That's the capital region. That'd be like uh, Donald Trump saying, um, hello, Daniel, you're in charge of Washington, D.C. That'd be really good because Washington, D.C. is 
pretty royal mess. But, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, Donald Trump does not have a Daniel in charge of Washington, D.C. right now. Then the king, uh, after doing this, placed him in charge of all the wise men. And that's found in Daniel chapter 2. What a good decision, right? Because those wise men were not so wise, right? Well, nobody could have that kind of wisdom. It really took Jehovah God to make that miracle happen, right? So, our second point today is this. Our second point goes like this. Stand up. Not only do we want to stand out, but we want to stand up. And that's exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They were required to bow down to a giant gold statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. You know, so sometimes people, uh, how did that statue get there? Sometimes people are uh, trying to, you know, butter you up and make people, you know, make you think really uh, kindly about them. And somebody got Nebuchadnezzar to say, man, there's nobody like you, King Nebuchadnezzar. You're the great, you're awesome. Man, you're a god. We should have a gold statue of you so we could come worship you. Wouldn't that be a great idea, almighty great king? So, you know, like anybody else that's in a position of power, they like to have that those kind of words. And uh, sure enough, a gold statue. Well, are we supposed to worship gold statues? Well, you know, nobody goes to... New York to the harbor and worships the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty represents some awesome, cool things, but we don't go worship the Statue of Liberty. But that's what the people in Babylon were asked to do. And of course, they're like, that's the greatest king ever. Of course, we're going to go uh, worship there. So that's a bad thing to have happen. And uh, Daniel um, um, has been on a food strike, might seem minor compared to what? These three buddies did to Daniel. Daniel knows nothing about this in the scriptures. They refuse to worship. So while everyone else is like, great king, you're rock, this is awesome, there's none like you, these three guys are standing up and they're like, we are not worth worshiping. Now, do you think that they were noticed when they are standing up? Well, absolutely. So uh, here goes the story and uh, to see how it is, because everyone is there, the music's playing, whatever the instruments play, everyone is supposed to bow down and worship the statue. And there's these three guys that happen to be Jews that are standing up and they're like, no, we're not going to do that. We are not going to worship any pagan God and we're not going to dishonor our God. We refuse to bow down. So um, what is that? What, um, where does that come from in the uh, scriptures? That's actually the first commandment of the Ten Commandments, right? You will have no other gods besides me, right? There is no other God, I'm number one, right? And so for them to do that would have been breaking the first commandment and actually the second commandment too because there's not supposed to be any graven image that you worship, right? Our God is um, everywhere, right? He's not a statue. He's not made by human hands. So um, here's the uh, scriptural part from the story. Um, Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king Nebuchadnezzar, we uh, do not defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing uh, furnace, The God we serve is able to deliver us from it. But if he won't deliver us from it, from your majesty's hand, even if he doesn't deliver us, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. That comes from Daniel chapter 3. So that's what the story shares with us as well. And now guess what? The story says the king is super mad. Okay, he's human mad. He makes that furnace seven times hotter. And while and he says, throw them scallywags in there. What do you mean they won't worship my golden image? So the officers that are taking the guys there, this furnace is so hot that when they're coming over to the furnace, it's putting out so much heat that the guys, as they're getting ready to toss these men into the furnace, die from the heat. Now that's a hot furnace. Right? 
Have you ever been around a smelter or something before? I'm telling you, it puts out some heat. It like, makes your skin like feels like the hairs are singeing on there. These men dropped dead when they were coming up to it. It was so hot. So this is a miserable, super hot furnace, and these guys are tossed into that furnace. So I think that's a pretty amazing thing. So um, the Lord God, however, had the final statement. As a king thought, thought he had the final statement. This is what happens to those that don't listen to my royal decree. And this is what God says. This is what happens when somebody stands up for me. Because the king looks into that furnace and the scripture says, and the story he shares with us, that there was a fourth person in there and he looked like the son of the gods. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't understand about who Jesus is. But we believe scripturally that that's actually Jesus before his time that we call it pre-incarnate Jesus. So there, these guys are in there experiencing an amazing miracle. Because surely as they were going in, they felt like we we're going to be singed up. But that's okay, we're going to make that stand anyways. So it's a pretty amazing thing. And um, this is almost like saying, this is what happens when people have loyalty to me. So the king is so impressed and so in awe with the power of God that he declares a new law across the land. You die if you say anything against the one true God. That's amazing to think about. So once again, we see that um, these foreign kings who have gold statues and expect people to worship them are like, man, there is none like our Jehovah God. And everybody across the land is going to see it the same way. Well, here's my final point today. The final point is, now many years later, decades and decades of time, so I don't want you to get the view that every day was like this for Daniel um, and the history buddies, because it wasn't. But it came around again. So our final point is this, stand firm. Daniel was now a man of 80 years of age. King Nebuchadnezzar is long gone. He's passed away. Uh, Daniel would serve under many kings uh, during his time. And we reach Daniel chapter 6, just three more chapters down the road. It's the famous story, Daniel in the lion's den. Like, so I met some little kids yesterday when we were at uh, River of Life and uh, asked them about, have you guys ever heard of Daniel in the lion's den? And they were even like, yeah. Yeah, Pastor, we've heard of that. I mean, like, pretty much everybody has heard the story of Daniel and the lion's den. So we have some familiarity with it, and we might say it's uh, for sure the best-known story in the book of Daniel. Have you ever stopped to think that Daniel spent one night in the den of lions, but he spent a lifetime from a boy of 16 years of age until into his 90s, this time he's in his 80s. He's got some more years to go. In the palace of pagan kings. Which do you think would have been more dangerous? One night with some lions? Or spending a lifetime in those king, with those kings who at any time could have your, as soon as you displeased them one time. It's amazing to think. Surely God was with Daniel to see Daniel go all of those years. It's amazing to think. So, the lions uh, couldn't touch him nor could the uh, palaces of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, King Nabonidus, King Belshazzar, King Darius of the Medes, or Cyrus the Great. None of these ever uh, ended Daniel's life. He served loyally under them, just like God asked him to do. Daniel was in constant danger, however, and we need to know that the Lord carried him through these things. Um, it's an important point to know the Lord is always faithful in our lives. We may blow it at times, but our God is always faithful to us. So in the story, Daniel's favor before the king. He's in a great position. He's the third most powerful person in the kingdom at that time under Darius. And other politicians are jealous. Um, we might even hear rumors today that... Um, some uh, from the opposite party may be jealous of our president today. They might intentionally be doing things that might bring harm to the country, but so that it would embarrass the president. And things. So sometimes I hear these type of things, and I reflect back 
well, that's nothing new under the sun because that's what the politicians were doing during the time of King Darius and uh, trying to make Daniel look bad. You see, Darius was just about ready to make um, Daniel the prime minister of his entire kingdom. That's an amazing thing to think about. So they tricked the king once again into signing this decree that basically said for the next 30 days, all prayers must be offered only to King Darius because he's a deity. King, there's none like you. You're awesome. You rock. Doesn't that sound like kind of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? So Daniel's like, here we go again, right? So, um, so for the next 30 days, Daniel is not supposed to do what he does uh, twice a day, which is in the morning and in the evening. He goes to his home. He doesn't make a big scene about it, but he opens his windows and he faces towards Jerusalem and he lifts a praise to Jerusalem to remember God and thank God for his carrying time, right? So uh, it says in uh, 610 of Daniel that he didn't do anything crazy. He didn't say, he didn't stand up and say, King Darius, you're off your rocker. I'm not going to worship you. But he also didn't do anything cowardly. He continued to do what he normally did was when he went home, he went home and he prayed just like he normally did with the windows wide open. Now, those men knew Daniel's character. They had seen and heard about Daniel because these guys are not in their 90s or 80s. But they knew about Daniel's background. They knew about Daniel's integrity. They knew exactly what Daniel was going to do. They knew he was going to go home and pray to Jehovah God. See, Daniel had a reputation. It was a good reputation, and it reminds us we should have a good reputation. The matter was brought to King Darius' attention, and um, it forced his hand. See, King Darius loved Daniel, but he had signed a royal decree that not even the king could cancel. And basically the punishment was, into the lion's den you must go. So Darius isn't mad at Daniel. He's just like, I, perhaps your God will save you. Because he knew about the stories about how Daniel had been saved before. The king has him put in there, seals up the place. He has to listen to what the politicians have said. But Daniel stands firm, and in he goes. So, um, though the king tried to encourage Daniel, um, he said, trust in your God, he can deliver you, in verse 16. Uh, but he feared that, uh, you know, the lions were going to eat him. So the king has a restless night, he doesn't sleep, he's up all night long. But verse 20 says he ran to the uh, pit, had the stone rolled away, and said, Daniel, are you in there? And of course, Daniel's voice comes back out. See, it says in scripture that God had sent an angel to shut the lion's mouths. So Daniel spent the night in there with the lions and comes out, the faithful prophet that he is. And the king found him alive and well. So this miracle caused Darius to testify about how great God is. And that was what I shared with you earlier. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations, all the peoples of every kingdom, in every language that was known to him. May you prosper greatly. What a great way to start a letter, right? I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For the third time, a foreign king, a conqueror, is uh, praising our God. Isn't that an amazing thing? But the Lord could do such a thing as this. So in closing today, um, we want to be on God's agenda. Right? The story of chapter 18 shows us how to live out our lives and God's agenda with a lower story of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. The story of Daniel is amazing. The story of his friends is um, cool to see as well. And that, that should be our story as well. You know, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 tells us that we should always... Um, be found faithful and remember that we are strangers and aliens in this world. Our kingdom is not of this earth. Our kingdom is of another place. We are children of the kingdom of God, right? And so we're blessed to live in America, but our loyalty should be to our God, right? And so if our country ever asked us to do something that would be wrong and be against the things that we hold dear in our faith, would we have the courage that Daniel has to stand firm 
Would we have the courage to stand out? Would we have the courage to stand up? And that's the things that I would encourage you to have today. Uh, Daniel's hometown was Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was always on our mind. But we are also with a hometown. Our, according to the Bible, our hometown is New Jerusalem. And that one day is the city that we'll all dwell in if we know the Lord, right? Peter says that uh, as aliens and strangers, Jesus would want us to uh, live a life that would witness to those people that were around. And Daniel and his friends uh, certainly lived that life. Um, 1 Peter 2.11 gives us uh, these instructions. Be careful not to get sucked into the lifestyle of the world around you. And uh, finally, to live a life that points others to God.